when the Canadian Pacific Railway was built. Many of its critics scoffed at the foolishness of trying to build an all-Canadian route, which meant passing through the Precambrian rock north of Lake Superior. But it was the all-Canadian route which opened up Sudbury and led to the discovery of the nickel and copper deposits of the Sudbury Basin. Fred LaRose, a blacksmith working on the Temiskaming and Northern Ontario Railroad. Fred threw his hammer at a fox, but he missed. Instead, he uncovered a rich vein of silver ore, and the LaRose mine at Cobalt was soon in operation. Early discoveries of ore bodies led to systematic prospecting, and such prospecting throughout the world led to the realization that the Precambrian rocks are a treasure house of mineral resources. In Canada, the iron ore deposits of Labrador, the gold mines of northern Ontario and Quebec, the uranium mines of Ontario and the Northwest Territories all belong to the Precambrian. And in South Africa, the Rand Gold Mines, situated on the largest gold deposits in the world, take their wealth from Precambrian rocks. In Brazil and Sweden, rich iron mines have been developed in the Precambrian. Cambrian have led to its investigation and its unmasking. But to find the rich ores, geologists and prospectors have to know where to look. And in one major respect, the Precambrian makes the search difficult. Fossils in Cambrian and later rocks provide geologists with a very reliable tool for dating and correlating them. But the generally primitive, one-celled organisms of Precambrian time have disappeared almost without trace. A few clues remain. Stromatolites, the fossils of blue-green algae in the Northwest Territories. Some possible worm burrows in Australia. But the finds are generally too limited to be useful in documenting Precambrian rocks. In the absence of fossils, Another useful technique has been developed to date rocks. Called radiometric dating, it relies on predictable rates of radioactive decay in certain elements as a guide in determining the age of rocks. For example, some uranium decays at a known and predictable rate to lead. With radiometric dating, the ages of rocks containing both uranium and lead can be established with a fair degree of certainty. In Canada, these techniques have enabled geologists to develop a useful date map of the Canadian Shield, information of major importance for mining prospectors. There appear to be two broad time divisions within the Shield, the Archean and the Proterozoic. The Archean areas, or provinces, are the oldest Precambrian rocks. The Proterozoic provinces are the later Precambrian rocks. 
On the ground, the age differences between the provinces of the shield can be dramatically emphasized. For example, the MacDonald Fault stands out quite clearly as the boundary between the Archean slave province and the younger rocks to the south. Usually, however, the boundaries between the provinces are much less prominent. Two of the Canadian Shield provinces, Superior and Slave, belong to the old part of the Precambrian, the Archean. These Archean provinces are characterized by the so-called greenstone belts, composed of volcanic and sedimentary rocks. A typical greenstone belt might be 40 kilometers wide and 400 kilometers long. How these belts were formed remains a part of the Precambrian mystery. But whatever their origin, their commercial value is beyond doubt. Much of Canada's silver, 30% of her copper, and 40% of her zinc comes from these greenstone belts. So, an exploration program in the older Archean provinces in search of silver or copper or zinc naturally concentrates on the greenstone belts and not on the terrain around them. This isn't the case in the younger provinces of the Shield, where there are no greenstone belts and minerals are more generally distributed. This difference in the rocks of the Archean and Proterozoic is apparent in shield areas throughout the world. It suggests very strongly that an important change in the Earth's geological processes occurred at the end of Archean time. 